uh, you see us. Uh, that's Mafun Academy, um, educational program by International Association of Fino Ugric People's Youth. And uh, we arrange uh, this kind of talks about Uralic and other indigenous peoples, their languages, their cultures, and so on. And we are glad to introduce you the world of Fino Ugric peoples and to provide you knowledge about other indigenous peoples of mainly Russian Federation and Eurasia. Uh, okay, thanks for joining us once again. Uh, I'm glad to introduce you our uh, speaker for today. Uh, she is a prominent lecturer. Her name is uh, Shivan Wilkin. She is a doctor. She uh, has uh, her PhD and now she works as a postdoctoral uh, researcher at Max Planck Institute for the Science uh, of Human, like of human history. Yes, and uh, Shivan will uh, tell us today how daring was invented in Mongolia and how uh, it influenced uh, to the world and the way we know world today. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, you have a chat um, for asking questions to Shivan. She will be reading them and answering them uh during the lecture or maybe after her after her presentation she will decide by herself uh, okay once again th thanks everyone and uh i'm giving mic to shivan hi uh thank you again for inviting me to give this talk i'm very excited um i apologize for the typo on the title slide of um mafun academy that was definitely my bad. Um, but yes, I am going to talk to you about work I've done over the past four years related to the history of daring in ancient Mongolia. So this project is this small bit of a project of daring is part of a much larger project on the economic and population histories of Mongolia from the Neolithic all the way through the Mongol Empire. Um, this worked with the Institute I'm at in Germany, the Max Planck Institute, um, a number of members of the Department of Archaeology, as well as the Department of Archaeogenetics. And uh, we also work very closely with members of the National University of Mongolia, their Department of Archaeology and Anthropology, as well as the University of Zurich, who runs all of our samples on the more technical equipment. So over the past four years, We've published numerous papers with, um, with these samples. We, the first paper that came out was a proteomic study, which I'll include a little bit on today. Uh, that one was a combined proteomics and metagenomic sample or uh, study on one site in the late Bronze Age of Mongolia. Um, next, we also did a paper on a Bayesian modeling of all of the radiocarbon dates of the Bronze Age of Mongolia to really figure out how the different cultures, um, how they ran in time, like how, you know, which ones came first, how long did they last, when did the next, when, when did the next culture arrive? Um, and that's been extremely helpful um, as it's a very confusing time period with not enough research already. Um, the next paper we did was on, uh, it was a stable isotope uh, paper where we looked for when, uh, ancient and historic Mongolians first started to cultivate and consume millet, as well as other, other crops that were grown. Uh, the paper that I'm talking about today is how dairy pastoralism has sustained Eastern steppe populations for the past 5,000 years. Um, you get a lot of detail on that. And then um, we have one more paper that's a preprint that's just come out in the past couple of weeks, and that's our genomic study uh, the the 6,000 year genetic history going back to the Neolithic again to the Mongo period. Um, and I can briefly talk about that one, um, but, but not too much. I'll just bring up some details from that in the end. So our biggest questions for the what I'm talking about today, we're looking at, at daring and how daring got to Mongolia. And um, if you can see where it says Eastern Steppe, uh, pretty far to the side, that's where Mongolia is, as of course you guys know. Um, but when we see the earliest evidence for dairying using both protein research, archaeological data, 
um, and lipid data, which is where people look at the certain types of fats in archaeological uh, ceramics. We find those in Anatolia at 7000 BC at a very famous site called Chateau Huyok. Um, there we find evidence for um, the dairying of ruminant animals, such as cows, sheep, and goats. Um, then up where today is modern-day Poland, uh, we found dairy lipids um, in some ceramics. And if you can see this ceramic with the holes in it, that's assumed to be some sort of strainer to make cheese. It'd be a way to actually push down on the, the, the milk once it starts to curdle and pushes all the way out which is the liquid part of the milk and leaves back the curds so you can process um, whatever milk you're using into cheese. Also in Northern Kazakhstan, uh, there has been evidence presented for horse milking using stable deuterium isotopes in ceramics, although the results for that are much more of a seasonal signal than a, a milk versus meat signal. So we're actually still working on some projects to further investigate that. A little bit further towards um, the Eastern Steppe in the in the Altai or not the Altai, um, the Tarim Basin in Xinjiang, China, uh, we have these uh, Tarim mummies where if you can see the tiny little white dots around the, the neck of the, um, the mummy there, there was actually a necklace made of dried kefir cheese. And through protein research, we were able to identify, um, not we, the, the researchers who looked at the skeleton, were able to identify ruminant milk again. But as you can see in Mongolia, before this project began, there's very little known about any sort of dairying. So pastoralism in Mongolia today is extremely important. About 40% of the population is still living as a um, nomadic pastoral dairy herder. Uh, they move about four times a year to different seasonal pastures. Um, and it's, we know that we believe that this, this kind of practice of moving multiple times during the year and having, you know, very ephemeral living spaces, such as these gares, likely went on until the past. But again, we don't really know how far back. So today, uh, Mongolians consume the milk of sheep and goat, uh, yaks, cows, camel, reindeer, and horse. And well, the, the milk of all of these animals is extremely important to a lot of Mongolians, what seems to hold the most importance is the fermented alcoholic horse milk, Irag, which is called numerous things throughout, throughout the steppe region. Um, but that, yeah, that seems to be the most important culturally significant uh, traditional project, product, and that's one that we looked into in detail. So the Heirloom Microbes Project is um, something that, um, it's a more, it's a modern study looking at modern Mongolians today and the different dairy products that they produce. Um, what we're really trying to do here is to travel to numerous different sites, uh, interview the families who are living as nomadic pastoralists with the different animals they have, and talk to them in detail on the types of products they produce, the methods in which they produce them. Um, and we also took samples from a number of these products in order to test them for uh, like a metagenomic test to look at um, the, the product itself, but also the bacteria in the product that may have been for, used to ferment into different products, um, but also look at the same questions with, with proteins too. So it's a combined, a combined projects of proteins and genomics, metagenomics, uh, to look at the, the, all the differences in these products in different environments uh, across Mongolia. That is still ongoing, and unfortunately we don't have results yet uh, to share with you, but I can give you a little idea on the different sites. So this top star in the corner is the part of the trip that I was on, or the top two stars. Um, the top star, we actually worked with reindeer herders um, who live in a community of about maybe 200 people split into family groups of anywhere from two to five people. And they move around the landscape in the, the taiga right up abutting Siberia um, for most of the year. Um, at the second star, uh, that's more people who have uh, horses, sheep, goat, uh, yaks, sorry, not camels, not that far north. Um, um, but they actually don't, they use horses for, for traction and for riding them, but it's much more rare for people to consume horse milk that far north. Um, the middle star, again, is mainly ruminants with some horse again. And then the, the star far down in the bottom is in the Gobi Desert. And all of these animals are used besides reindeer, but also camels are very heavily milked there as well. So we have a very big uh, range of animals and products that we're looking at. So just to give you an idea of the products that people do use today in Mongolia, 
Uh, we have fresh milk, which is generally consumed shortly after it's taken from the animal. Usually not a ton of this is consumed, but it is occasionally. Mostly it's incorporated into this homemade milk tea. Uh, it's not the kind of tea that you would make with um, like a, a tea bag steeping in water. It's more with um, different like minerals and herbs and local grasses are made into this tea and milk is added. Uh, the milk tea can vary a lot in taste and consistency uh, because all different species of animals are used to make it. Uh, for example, the reindeer milk um, used in the tea is extremely delicious as it's very high fat and has a very rich taste. So from the fresh milk, it's then fermented. And on the right, you can see the, the bucket with, you can see what it's kind of foaming and curdling. And that is where you collect the milk of your animals over a three to five days. And you keep mixing it together and you just leave it outside to ferment naturally. Um, this, and that's with sheep, uh, goat, and uh, cow milk, which does curd. There's a lot of caseins, which you make cheese out of. Um, but if you look over on the left side, the horse milk has a very low casein content, uh, which means it doesn't have as much of the solids, but it does have a lot of the sugars and the liquid portion, which means it's very easy to ferment into an alcoholic beverage. Uh, that can range anywhere from 2% to about 12% in alcohol. Um, it's usually consumed just during the summer, um, but additionally, it can be further distilled into a clear liquor um, and that can have an alcohol percentage of up to 20%. And it tastes kind of like an old, old Parmesan cheese. Not great, but not, but not bad. Um, that fermentation, um, that fermented milk, especially the sheep, goat, and cow, is then uh, boiled and heated. Uh, and that kills a lot of the harmful bacteria. And it also helps it curd a little bit more. And then it's manually processed. That photo in the middle is a colleague of mine making butter. And the last photo on the bottom is actually urum, which is more of a spreadable, almost kind of like a cream cheese. Um, some people use it plain, some people add a bit of salt, and some people add a bit of sugar, depending on what part of Mongolia you're in and what people like. And then finally, we have the air and sun-dried products. Um, and in the bottom picture with the, the boards and the rocks, that's the dairy product in the, in the middle, the white product, and it's being squished down. So to squeeze out as much of that liquid portion that way as possible, then it's either um, put on the roof to dry as, as it is, or it's either crumbled or sliced into bits. And it's, it's put on the, on the top of the gear that they live in to dry. And those products are extremely shelf stable and they can be kept at room temperature in the gear for up to two years and be consumed at a later date, which is really helpful in the winters when you're not getting a lot of uh, milk products because the animals are no longer milking. So one of our primary questions was how can we look for this in the past? How can we see who's a dairy pastoralist, who's dairying, who's milking? Um, and there are a number of ways that we can do this. So First off, we can look at historic texts, which are extremely illuminating and can tell us a ton. Um, we can look at people writing about their experiences with dairy. We can talk about people writing recipes. We can look at people from other groups talking about their experiences or observations of another culture and what they do with, with milk and dairy products. And of course, other food items. Uh, you can also look to archaeological remains, the remains of the animals, if you can tell if they're domesticated or wild can help, if you can tell the ages and sex of the animal as well. Uh, you can look for certain patterns that can be indicative of a dairying population. Um, furthermore, we can look at lipid analysis of ceramics and residues, of course the proteins as well, um, and we can, we can determine through more archaeologically scientific ways whether people were using dairy. Um, the proteins here, we can, we, there are some papers published in the last um, six years where people have first identified that you can, ident you can see milk consumption in dental calculus and, of course, the kefir cheese that I mentioned before. So when we're looking at what's going on in Mongolia, I'm going to start in the Mongol Empire and then go back in time from there. So the Mongol Empire, um, there are, there's a very important text called The Secret History of the Mongols that is considered to be the first text in the actual Mongolian language. And in this book, I, I read through a translation and there are 31 different mentions of milk consumption, mostly talking about the fermented mare's milk, but also mentions of ruminant milk as well. 
There are also a ton of mentions of different animals, again, primarily horses, as they were extremely important, um, as well as mentions of sheep, goat, and cattle. Archaeological evidence from the time period, we have remains of what are obviously domesticated dairy animals, IRAG drinking vessels, um, but this is really cool. There was this fountain that there are artistic depictions of, but no one has yet recovered the actual uh, fountain yet. That was in Karkor in the Mongol capital, and it was commissioned for the Palace of the Khan. And it was designed by a Frenchman that they captured in Hungary and kind of forced him to design this, this fountain. It was made fully of silver, very ornately decorated, and Irag, other milk-based spirits, and even wine sometimes, depending on who was visiting, would come out of the pour spouts during different um, you know, feasts and festivals. When you go to the empire previous to that, which is about a thousand years before, we have the Shangnu Empire, we still have historic documents, but we no longer have documents that were written by the Mongols um, at this point. Um, there may have been written texts at that point by them, but none of them survived. So what we're going by are, are different accounts that were written by members of the Han Dynasty while visiting the Shangnu. And they talk mainly about uh, domesticated horses, sheep, goat, and cattle, and how uh, the Mongols really liked their horse alcohol as well. Um, archaeological evidence, we have similar evidence to the Mongol period where people are killing their, fawn, their, their animals in, a, in patterns that are very consistent with daring. Uh, and that basically just means that a lot of the females are dying at a very old age, meaning that they've been kept for many, many years. Um, to produce more offspring and produce more milk. And a lot of the, the males, there are a couple of males that are kept to impregnate the females, but a lot of the younger males are, are killed for food at a younger age. Um, we also see those same pastoral settlement patterns and materials. If you look at this piece of ceramic, it's really similar to the one found in Poland, although this one has not been tested yet. And some people do think it may be more of a rice cooker, although Mongolia is very dry and quite difficult to grow rice in. So could be a cheese maker, could be a rice steamer, not quite sure yet. Uh, just before that, in the early Bronze Age, I'm sure you guys know about the, the really cool Pazirk mummy with the amazing tattoos in the Siberian Altai. Uh, she was buried with sheep and horses, um, as well as pieces of their meat. Uh, the archaeologist who excavated also found a ceramic vessel with something that seemed to be a dairy product, possibly a yogurt. Um, so unfortunately, that piece of ceramic has been cleaned and it's difficult to look at now. Uh, but also her dental remains showed evidence of a very pastoral diet, which mainly means like not a lot of cavities, but a lot of that dental plaque, dental calculus that we'll talk about very shortly. So once we get to the Bronze Age, we're out of written records. We have nothing. We have no, we have no written records to guide us here, which is really unfortunate. Uh, we also have very few habitation sites because as, um, as the, the settlements were these houses that they can easily pack up and move four times a year, they don't really leave much of a mark in the landscape. And even if they had left a bit of a mark, the, the winds across the steppe severely deflate the ground and not much is left behind. So the archaeology and the record is actually really dominated by, if you can see in the background, that kind of big pile of stones. Those are uh, the burial mounds, um, the stone burial mounds that um, they call here Xoros in Mongolia, but you would call a Kurgan in, in Kazakhstan or, or Russia, um, and where there are a bunch of stones piled up in the person underneath. Um, unfortunately, in Mongolia, grave goods like ceramics or bronze items or um, anything else are rarely included. So um, here's another image of a, different, of a different one in northern Mongolia. So we do end up having human burials from many regions across the country. Um, some of them have domains of, remains of pastoral animals like sheep, goat, or cow, either included in the grave or in burials that are around, uh, around the main grave. But they're very difficult to determine whether they are domesticated or not. Um, these bones are usually really fragmentary and sometimes they're even burned. So they're really hard to differentiate from say a wild sheep to a domestic sheep. Um, once we hit around 1200 BC in the late Bronze Age, uh, horses start to be included in these burials as well. And these horses at 1200 BC also show some different um, bone changes on the skull that seem to be indicative of either horse riding and, and bridling and bidding. So it seems that around 1200 BC, maybe people were starting to, to ride horses in the area. 
so the main questions that I had going in was when did dairying start in Mongolia? Um, how and when did the different species that they used, um, how, and, how, and, how and when did these different species come in? And when did this horse dairying start? So thinking about what materials we actually have to look at this, uh, we realized that we had a ton of human dental calculus that we could analyze. So what we did was we knew we had the evidence from the Mongol period and the Xiongnu period that people were daring their animals, including horses. And um, so we thought that, that maybe this would go back into the, the, the late Bronze Age. So what we did is we took uh, calculus samples from 31 individuals and they lived between 3000 BC and 1400 AD. We did shotgun proteomics, which means um, we use a special machine called a tandem mass spectrometer that helps us identify specific amino acid sequences in peptides of proteins. Peptides are pieces of proteins. And with that, we can actually find species specific identification. So what we can learn from the calculus is some people use calculus to look for microfossils, which are little tiny bits of plants, like little bits of millet, little bits of wheat, little bits of minerals, like the green picture in the bottom. You can also look at genetic and proteomic evidence um, to look at. You can look at the oral microbiome of the mouth. Um, you can also look at human immune response in case there were any pathogens in the mouth. Um, and what we're doing is to use this calculus to look at dietary proteins. Um, often what we do is if we have enough of a sample, we do all of these things too, um, not just one. So to show you how this is actually done, you can see the teeth. Um, that stuff that seems to be coating them, that is dental calculus. So we chip that off wearing uh, sterile gloves, sterile instruments, and it goes directly into a tube. And that tube comes back to the research institute. We have a dedicated ancient protein lab where it is a clean lab where um, you go in in special clothing, everything's covered up, face masks, eye masks, hair nets, all of that double, triple gloves to make sure if you have to change a glove, your hand isn't exposed. So we take the sample in there, we demineralize and denature the proteins and reduce and alkylate. And basically all that means is you get the proteins out of that solid, that solid bit of calculus. And then you take the protein from being wrapped up to being in one long strand of amino acids. So it's this whole one long strand rather than all wound up together. We then digest it, which means the protein is cut at certain spots into peptides. And then those peptides are sent through the tandem mass spectrometer for peptide identification. And to give you a really brief overview of how that is done, oh, two slides, sorry. Um, here are two peptides from the most frequently recovered protein, milk protein, called beta-lactoglobulin, which I will refer to as BLG, so I don't have to keep saying beta-lactoglobulin. Um, and here are four different ruminant species, sheep, reindeer, goat, and cow. Each letter is a different amino acid, and each letter in red and underlined shows where they have differences between these species. Some are really similar. Sheep and goat are very similar. They only have one different, whereas like reindeer and goat and reindeer and cow have a number of, of, of differences. But furthermore, to look at horse milk, due to the deep um, evolutionary divergence of ruminants and horses, we really see that there are a lot more differences between the two, the two groups. So we can definitely, well, if you had that top peptide that starts V-A-G-T-W, that would be the same in a cow, a sheep, a goat, a reindeer, whereas if we have a horse, a number of those amino acids are different. So the results of this study were that this is the distribution of the dairy peptides over time. The blue uh, lines are, um, is, is a count of the number of ruminant associated peptides and the orange are the horse associated peptides. So in the early Bronze Age from 3000 BC up until 1200 BC, we see only ruminant peptides. It's not until the late Bronze Age that we see ruminant peptides, but also the inclusion of horse milk consumption. Um, once we get to the Iron Age, we see the same thing. Um, ruminant, mainly ruminant with a little bit of horse. But then once we're in that Mongol period, we see an almost equal number of, of peptides for each species. To just give you an idea of what this looks like per a single individual, along the bottom, I know it's very hard to see, if you can see that mishmash line of letters, uh, that is every amino acid in the protein BLG. 
what you see with the blue lines, each, each blue line is a peptide that we've recovered. So this individual had four counts of that first peptide. They had four different um, instances of that. And then as it goes on. So this individual is from Southeastern Mongolia. It's one of our earliest sites around 2500 BC. And this person was definitely only consuming ruminant milk. Once we get to the end of the Late Bronze Age and the beginning of the Iron Age, um, this individual from northeastern Mongolia is uh, from about 1000 BC and has a ton of evidence for ruminant dairy, but also a good handful of peptides that are specific to horse as well. So this person was definitely drinking both types, but most likely more often ruminant milks. Then once we get to the, the Mongol period, this individual is actually from uh, South Mongolia who was excavated from the Gobi Desert. And this individual has almost completely horse milk peptides with a little bit of ruminant as well. Um, we do find more proteins than just BLG, whereas this individual had a, 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 a very unique protein as well that's only found in camel milk, which would make sense since this individual is from the Gobi and that's where camels live. So to give you an idea of how this looks on the map, these are our three earliest samples. The first one that we had is in the middle of the map and from 3000 BC. And this individual was buried under um, one of those uh, burial mounds, which is in the style of the Afanasevo, which is genetically identical to the Yamnaya who originated in the Pontic Caspian steppe. Um, so these, we think that this first person who came in with dairying was actually a Western step person from that Yamnaya Afanasevo culture group. Um, further off to the West, we have two that are in the, uh, the Altai and the Gobi Altai. And, and these two people, again, are drinking ruminant milk. Um, they're drinking sheep and goat milk. And they also um, are under kurgans of, of Western step cultures. So once we go to um, the Middle Bronze Age, we can see the site up in the north um, that had both uh, sheep milk and goat milk and other peptides that are more indicative of um, other ruminants as well, where we can't be as specific. The same thing they see over in, in uh, Eastern Mongolia. Uh, this is up until about 1300 BC. Once we hit 1200 BC, this includes this map includes the Late Bronze Age and the um, the single individual we had from the Shangnu period. And you can see that the horse milk really starts popping up and it's not just in the in the West, it's also in the East. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty interesting um, incorporation of the horses at this point. Again, it goes hand in hand with the evidence for horseback riding. Once we get to the Mongol period, again, horses are everywhere. Horse milk drinking seems to be across the country and the ruminant milk, of course, continues. So uh, to briefly conclude this study, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about a couple of other things, some future work. Um, the Eastern Eurasian steppe dairying began about 1500 years before our original hypothesis, which was extremely exciting to find. Um, that the early ruminant dairying that we saw um, is definitely from people from the Western steppe. To take a little bit of data from that uh, preprint of the genomics paper, um, we can definitely tell that the person in the middle had a 100% Afanasevo genetic ancestry, and the other people that were in that Altai area um, had slightly different um, genetic background. It was definitely Western steppe, but more from, from Northern Kazakhstan rather than from the Pontic Caspian steppe. And what we can see again from the genetics paper is that there was very little, like, well, the Afanasevo may have come in and brought dairying practices to Mongolia, there's very little genetic legacy left behind from them. It's, it's more a local, uh, local ancient um, North Eurasian ancestry mixed in with some, some more from a little bit later in the Bronze Age on the Western steppes, uh, as well as from like um, Iran up through that inner Asian mountain corridor, uh, through the mountains from Iran up into the Altai. Um, also, what was interesting is we found no evidence for lactase persistence, which is the genetic adaptation to be able to actually break down lactose into glucose and lactose as an adult. Um, but uh, modern Mongolians don't have it either, and it seems like they're drinking milk and consuming dairy just fine. So there may be some other, something else at, at work there, which is another question of the Early Microbes Project I mentioned at the beginning. 
Um, again, I just want to highlight that the equine milk consumption coordinated with that likely shift to horseback riding too. So the some little bit on the further and ongoing work. Um, one thing I'm really interested in now is, as you can see, the star in the bottom corner, and uh, we see 6,500 BC, 7,000 BC, that Daring in Anatolia, and we see the Mongolia at 3,000 BC, but how did it get there? How did this, these ideas and these Daring practices transfer? So one thing that we're looking at now is this area of, of the Pontic Caspian steppe, which could go hand in hand with a, a Caucasus dispersal of, of the daring practices coming up through the Caucasus, but it also could have come up through uh, through Europe as well, and then over the Black Sea too. So that's a question we have too. Um, and because what you see is from the from the genetics paper and the daring is we see this movement from that Pontic Caspian steppe all the way to Mongolia, um, but we don't actually know when people started daring on the Pontic Caspian steppe. So that's my next project where I have samples from here. I have 100 different samples, ranging from 5,000 to 1,200 BC. Uh, they span um, from Southwest Russia, almost abutting um, the, the border of Georgia, um, all the way up until just over the Urals, almost abutting Kazakhstan. So we know that in that region, uh, domestic ruminants, sheep, cow, and goat have been present for quite a long time, since 4,700 BC. A lot of work has been done with things like stable isotopes, um, but uh, we just really, uh, we really don't know from those whether people were actually dairying or not, and if so, which species were they dairying. So that is going to be the next project. Um, and with that, I will thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I was very happy to present it. It's my favorite. It's my favorite work. Very happy to talk about daring with anyone who's willing to listen. Very much appreciate it. Yeah, I'm also very interested to, if anyone has um, upcoming projects where you would like to have an archaeological um, a, a chat about um, how the archaeology fits into different things like that relate to um, dairying, whether it's in the past or today, I'm always, always happy to discuss any of those things. Um, so I see a question about how daring was spread from Mongolia to the more western steppe, and we actually think that it came the other way. We think that, well, we, we do think that it's possible that some of the, the horse daring traditions may have moved from east to west, but that is an ongoing debate, and we need a lot more information for that. But we definitely think that daring was happening in the Western steppe, like the Pontic Caspian steppe and, and um, Kazakhstan as well. Uh, and at possibly also less the southern areas of Iran and through that mountain corridor as well before it reached Mongolia. But we need to do a lot more work to figure that out for sure. Oh, so links between the Eurasia Triangle and my project. Um, we actually, we have, um, the links are more that when we publish our papers, 
or at least the papers that are related to dairying and the spread of dairying. Well, we definitely work together with members of the Eurasia Triangle, especially um, Martina Rubitz, as just how to how to incorporate ideas of, of Proto-Indo-European and the spread of dairying as well into the way that we're looking at these questions and how we interpret our results. Hmm, that's very interesting, finding the key to how the Altaic peoples had spread from China to modern day Turkey. Yeah, there seems to be, um, it seemed to be pretty early on, a lot of people were going from the west to the east, but then a ton of people were also going east to the west after a certain point too. It's something that, that's, what's really interesting about that is that is something that we can look at with archaeology, um, it, we could look at it with archaeology, we could look at it with, with linguistic and textual evidence, but also the linguistics that we look at before, you know, before we have any records as well. It's a very, it's a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting question and I really look forward to the results on that. Yeah, I think a lot of people were moving, as, as, at least once we get, once we get to the, the Bronze Age, uh, the Bronze Age people are definitely going multiple different directions, not just west to east. Actually, one of the ways that we're actually starting to track that is we are working with with um, with different linguists to figure out different changes in language and the or incorporations of words that are related to dairying in order to see which groups had dairying and when and, and how they were moving around and, and um, interacting with each other. In America, daring traditions are extremely different. They are very commercial and industrial, and there are very few people doing small scale traditional daring. And there are a couple of people who do it, but they're more just kind of um, small artisanal shops, which are great. Um, but most of the dairy people consume is, is I would say 95% cow's milk with a, a very small percentage of sheep and goat products. And you rarely, if ever, I've never seen horse milk in the United States. Oh, uh, indigenous people, I have not a clue, not a clue on that. I'm sorry. Although, um, I feel like I don't remember ever hearing anything about Native American dairy practices. It was mainly bison, American buffalo, rather than having herds of cow, sheep, and goat. But I don't know. I'm sure plenty of people dairy today, I would hope. Very drastic difference, very drastic difference between, well, I mean, if you think about it, if you look at the step, the st on the steppe, it's extremely difficult to grow agricultural crops. Um, one of the big things in the United States all over uh, was maize or corn, which is not possible. It's very difficult to grow even, you know, wheat or barley uh, on the steppe without irrigation. And there was not much irrigation going on, um, especially in the Bronze Age. So while well, people in Russia and Kazakhstan were able to grow a number of crops, um, it was not the case, uh, not the case in the, in the arid steppe of Mongolia. So um, people really turned to, to their animals to who could eat the grasses that were growing to turn that ground cover into both nutritious caloric intake in either milk or cheese, but also hydration. Milk is around 90% water and then when your animals drink the waters from the streams, it's actually being cleaned throughout as, as their bodies process that into, into milk as well. So dairying is, is one, of the, one of the great things for people in these more arid environments to really kind of, it's a renewable source of hydration and, and nutrition, nutritional intake. So the question for, from Sarah here is that did dairy um, practices originate in one place or did they originate multiple times in different places? 
Um, I, that is a question that a lot of us who are working on dairying in uh, Europe, uh, in Eurasia, in East Asia, in Central Asia, and in Africa, and in the Near East are, are working on right now. Um, as, of, as of with the evidence we have now, it seems like dairying started in, the, um, in Anatolia in Southwest Asia, and it does seem like dairying practices kind of moved with people that were, were migrating with domestic animals, because as you see the domestic animals move through the map, um, actually I'm gonna go to this, this slide here. So as, as you see the domestic animals where the star is starting there, they move up into Europe, they move over into Iran and the Near East. And we do have evidence for this. We have some evidence of them moving down into Africa at a, as a much later date. Um, but that's not my area of expertise, but I know that dairying didn't start there until maybe 5,000, 4,000 BC. But I, I do think it did spread down from people that were dairying. However, it doesn't just mean that, you know, people, it was people spreading out. It could have been, you know, groups of people coming into an area meeting other people and just that, that knowledge is transferred along with, um, ideas of domesticating the animals. Um, but it does seem that it originated in one place, but I absolutely cannot discount the fact that it could have independently been, um, someone could have independently come up with the idea to dairy in another place. Okay, so there's a question about doing the dental analysis and the food they consumed and where they came from. So dental calculus has been used to look at diet for about five years. And in those five years, there are probably about six or seven papers that have come out. Um, it seems like milk proteins are one of the most likely to come to be identified. Um, I think it has something to do with uh, the, when the uh, dental calculus is forming, it's very, it's full of calcium binding proteins and there's a ton of calcium in milk. So those proteins seem to be very, easily incorporated into that calculus biofilm before it um, solidifies. We have found evidence for plant remains such as like wheat, barley, um, millet, but it's very difficult to find. It's not actually that they're that hard to find. They, I mean, they are more rare than a milk protein, but a lot of these plants are, the proteins are conserved through a lot of different species. So what we can normally say is we can talk about a, a, um, a genus or a family of plants, but it's very difficult to get at the species because there are very few um, pieces of that protein that would tell us a specific species versus something else. So right now, the easiest thing for us to do is identify dairy products. Um, but we are definitely thinking about different ways to improve the identification of other types of dietary foods. Um, I do usually suggest to um, combine a protein approach with something like stable isotope analysis, if it's possible, um, just because that way you'll get a more thorough and holistic idea of the person's whole diet rather than just what was retained in the calculus. Although, if anyone has samples where they are asking a very important dietary question, I'm also happy to, to talk about looking at those samples as well. Um, I can tell you a little bit about camel domestication, but that is mainly because um, camel domestication is a huge question mark. Because we have the, the, the dromedary camels, which are more in the Middle East, and we have the Bactrian camels, which are in Mongolia. And we really have no idea when the camels actually got up to Mongolia. We don't know where they were introduced from, who brought them up there. Um, of course, we have no idea when people started herding them or, or daring them. I mean, those are two different things. Herding a camel and using them to ride and to carry things is not the same thing as milking them. And they definitely do not always go hand in hand, hand in hand. Plenty of people use their camel to carry stuff and, and don't milk them or milk them and don't use them for, for traction. Um, so uh, yeah, camels are definitely difficult. Um, I know that there are some ongoing genetic studies of camels that are trying to actually trace 
the, the lines of, of domestication of, of both of the different subspecies of camel. So that should be coming up in the next couple of years. And if I, if I knew any of their preliminary results, I wish I could share them with you, but I, I actually don't know. Oh, okay. So, um, a brief rundown on how this project started was I had come to the, the Max Planck Institute in 2016 as a beginning PhD student. And I had a really interesting idea. I thought of doing, um, some sort of stable isotope analysis of a number of different sites across central Asia. And once I got there, I realized that, um, that wasn't going to happen. There were too many logistical problems and it just wasn't going to work out. So my supervisor asked me whether I'd like to work on something like um, other types of isotopes or proteomics or a DNA. And I, I had to actually look up proteomics because I had never heard the word before. Uh, but I really like biochemistry or the ideas of biochemistry. So I decided to go with that. Um, and I was introduced to Erdne Mayagmar, whose picture was on that first slide with all the different individuals. She is a professor of archaeology and osteoarchaeology at the National University of Mongolia. And her and I had actually met. We met and we discussed uh, what type of materials they had. And I told her the kind of questions I was interested in. And she told me the kinds of questions she was interested in. And then we ended up coming up with a lot of different uh, projects we could do, different hypotheses we could test. Um, so it really came from you know me being a newer student with an interest in this scientific method but also her immense archaeological knowledge of, of Mongolia's prehistory to really come to an understanding of what the big questions were and how we could go about answering them. It has been extremely enriching to me as a researcher because I was allowed to tackle this project as, as the PI of both the, um, the, the protein work and the stable isotope work. Um, it really taught me how to run a project how to ask scientific questions properly, how to actually um, produce the results in the lab, analyze the data, um, and most importantly, and I always say most importantly, is to incorporate those data into what we know of existing and developing archeological evidence. Because without that, it's meaningless. I can tell you when these animals, when people were consuming the, the milk of these animals, but without that knowledge and the thousands of papers and, and books and articles I read, um, not I, I, was, I wouldn't be able to tell you why it was important. And that's the biggest thing, because we are anthropologists and we are interested in, in the people and the culture and the behavior, not just the, not just the science. So it's been a big mixture of the anthropology, the archaeology and the science together that I think has been extremely enriching and satisfying. Well, it seems there are no more questions for you, Shivan. Thank you, everybody, for coming to hear my talk. I was very, very happy to share it with you. Thank you very much, Shivan. That was impressive, very interesting, very unusual for, for us linguists, activists, and so on. But I, I, I feel and uh, I hope that will be a great enrichment for all of us. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.